Um, it's really a great pleasure to, to, to be here today to share the panel with Steve, Gill, and Nina. My background is as a surgeon and researcher, and the evolution of my career over 35 years, from invasive to non-invasive, and from organs to cells, has been as a result of disruption within my industry. Today, it is a fact that most of us will suffer disabilities in our lifetimes, whether through injury, illness, or as a consequence of longevity. This has created an unprecedented demand for innovation in the life sciences to address the three R's, repair, regeneration, and replacement. The concept is, if a body part is damaged, it will be repaired, regenerated, or replaced. So what's in the toolbox? First, cells, more specifically stem cells, which are the building blocks for new tissues and organs. There are three main types of stem cells, embryonic, adult, and induced pluripotent stem cells. Embryonic stem cells may be considered controversial as they are derived from five-day-old human embryos. Some of us may recall the 2001 crash in the Nasdaq Biotech Index as a result of the George W. Bush moratorium limiting embryonic stem cell research, and this was on top of an already down market at the time. It really wasn't until nine years later, in 2010, when President Obama reversed this, that confidence returned to the biotech industry. And today, there is significant and robust corporate investment in stem cell therapies. One of the most researched indications is heart diseases, where there is now 15 years of um, clinical trial experience using stem cells to treat acute myocardial infarcts and heart failure. A typical myocardial infarct results in the death of a billion or more cardiomyocytes. These cells do not regenerate, but become scar tissue. And depending on the size of the infarct, some patients may develop heart failure. Stem cells can be delivered safely into the heart as established in clinical trials. Several questions remain, such as, what is the correct cell type? Can the cells integrate without inducing arrhythmias? And what about the manufacturing process? So these questions are being addressed in ongoing mid and late stage clinical trials with the hope that stem cell therapies may one day be available to treat heart diseases. In 2006, the stem cell field was itself disrupted by an incredible discovery first announced at the International Society for Stem Cell Research Meeting in Toronto. Shinya Yamanaka stunned an audience of some 4,000 scientists with his landmark discovery of a way to turn back the clock, to reprogram mature adult cells from a skin biopsy into youthful stem cells, which he called IPS cells, almost embryonic-like, but without the need to sacrifice human embryos. I was present at the time and could feel almost a palpable sense of skepticism and disbelief in the audience. But of course, this research was validated in labs around the world and Shinya received his Nobel Prize in 2012. Just imagine, clinician scientists might take a skin biopsy from you or me, and in the lab, reprogram our mature adult skin cells into youthful IPS cells, and then use these cells to grow whatever is required to treat a disease, heart cells, neurons, cartilage, liver cells, 
retinal pigment epithelial cells. But these therapies have proved challenging to develop. The first clinical trial using iPS cells in 2014 was conducted by an ophthalmologist, Masayo Takahashi, in Japan. Her patient was a 70-year-old elderly woman with near blindness as a result of age-related macular degeneration. What the team did was to take the patient's skin biopsy and in the lab reprogram her mature adult skin cells into youthful iPS cells, then grow a sheet of retinal pigment epithelial cells shown here, which was successfully implanted into her eye. So why the slow progress since then? Well, in the words of Nobel laureate Shinya Yamanaka, seen here reporting to the boss, <laughs> making iPS cells for this one patient took a painstaking one year and cost a million dollars. But perhaps inspired in the company of the private bank leader, Shinya has since conceptualized a bank, a stem cell bank, where his clients might deposit their tissues in any denomination. The bank would then convert these mature adult tissues into youthful iPS cells, ready to be dispensed from ATMs for future therapies. Medicine reimagined, yes, but truthfully, this is work in progress. The introduction of 3D printing alongside amazing advances in biomaterials has enabled us to print living tissues on demand. Using stem cells seeded onto scaffolds, it has been possible to print simple flat structures like skin to treat burns and hollow tubular structures like blood vessels and upper airway tubes. Organoval, a San Diego-based biotech company, was the first to print bits of liver tissue for drug toxicity testing. Here is the ETF for the 3D printing industry as a whole. Healthcare currently forms just 1% of the 3D printing industry, but is expected to grow to some 16% by 2020, when, according to Frost and Sullivan, the market for 3D printing of tissues, organs, and prosthetics may reach a billion dollars. Just six weeks ago, a Californian biotech company, Cellprogen, made a stunning announcement that it had 3D printed hearts using stem cells seeded onto scaffolds. This raises hope that 3D printed organs might one day be available for transplants. Until then, we face a real problem of an acute shortage of donor organs for transplants. Strategies to overcome this have included not just the use of organs from the deceased through donation or otherwise, but also organs or parts of organs from the living, both related and unrelated. I'd like to share with you this sculpture by UK's transplant pioneer, Sir Roy Khan, both a gifted surgeon and artist. Sir Roy named this sculpture Tribute to an Organ Donor in recognition of lives spent, sacrificed, donated, and shared with fellow human beings. Other strategies explored have included the use of animal organs as xenographs. While working with Sir Roy at Cambridge and subsequently running my own lab in Singapore, we did actively investigate the use of pigs as organ donors, but faced what seemed an unsurmountable immunologic challenge such that this cross-species research lost momentum. Then, in 2013, 
the discovery by Jennifer Doutner at UC Berkeley and others of the genome editing tool CRISPR-Cas9 sparked a renewed interest and enthusiasm in xenografts. Through the deletion of certain porcine genes using molecular scissors and the insertion of some human genes, it seemed possible to significantly dampen the human immune response to pig organs. The two CRISPR startups, Intellia Therapeutics and Editas Medicine, are unfortunately embroiled in pattern disputes for most of this year. Regardless, and the pattern disputes have been mainly between the inventors, Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley and Feng Zhang of the Broad Institute, MIT, who appears on the cover of Time Magazine's October 17th issue. Regardless, this disruptive technology has reawakened enthusiasm in creating human animal chimeras. Here are two biotech companies, United Therapeutics and eGenesis, pushing ahead with attempts to grow human tissue inside pigs with the goal of creating an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. Meanwhile, how do we get these organs into patients? How surgeons operate has undergone major disruption in the three decades that I have practiced surgery. From standing beside the patient, usually wearing rubber boots as there would be spillage of blood from these large open incisions, this was surgery 1.0, to using laparoscopes through keyhole incisions, surgery 2.0, to robotic surgery, surgery 3.0, first seated at the open platform Zeus robot to the current state-of-the-art Da Vinci robot. And in the future, surgery 4.0, which will be data-driven and artificially intelligent. The patient experience has been game-changing, from having to endure large painful incisions to rapid recovery from keyhole incisions. Leader in robotic surgery is Intuitive Surgical, which since it gained FDA approval at the turn of the century, has dominated with an absolutely stellar performance. 17 years on, as many of its patents expire, we are starting to see competition from the likes of Medtronix, which hopes to have a robot on the market by 2018, and Verb Surgical arising out of a joint venture between Johnson & Johnson and Google, which hopes to provide a common platform to enable digital computer-assisted surgeries. In closing, I would like to focus on the consumer and what is in the toolbox that enables us to be CEOs of our own health. Our smartphones equipped with sensors and health apps are becoming our medical devices. We do already generate and share our digital health data in real time. In this regard, the United Kingdom has taken an early lead in announcing that its NHS will provide from next year and for free mobile devices and health apps to millions of patients to enable them to remotely monitor their health. It's really quite incredible. So this digital revolution will disrupt the delivery of healthcare. Physicians are going to have to offer virtual consults. This is the future of medicine. City could not have chosen a better venue to host this autumn dialogues with a focus on transformation. Just walking in the streets of San Francisco, you might have passed one or two cyborgs, but didn't recognize them. This is because they are otherwise regular people who have integrated 
technology in their bodies, people who have chosen to biohack their bodies with implanted sensor microchips, even bionic eyes. From wearables to implantables, ingestibles to insidables, there's definitely going to be a lot more machine-human interaction. So really, um, it's really been an amazing pleasure to share this panel with um, incredible business, healthcare leaders, and deal makers. And what an incredible effort by City Private Bank under the leadership of Peter Charrington to have really engaged at the cutting edge of disruptive tech for the benefit of all of us investing clients. Thank you. <laughs>